Welcome to the Lessons from Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Brian Beckham. My next guest is Cyril White. Cyril knew George Floyd personally. Cyril was a basketball player in high school and college. He has spent roughly two-thirds of his adult life in China, where he is now a sports professional who takes basketball teams to China. He's also started a successful shoe brand and runs a basketball gym and a basketball program by the name of To God Be the Glory. That's To God Be the Glory, which you can find online at tgbtsports.com. I want to get Cyril on the podcast for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons, obviously, is because he knew George Floyd. And I wanted him to talk a little bit about what George Floyd was like So we can all keep in mind that this was a human being we're talking about. He's not a symbol. He's a human. And so Cyril talks about George quite a bit. I also wanted to have a discussion with Cyril about race relations in the country in general and what it was like for him as a black athlete and a black professional in China. And also some of the things that Cyril's doing and that what we all can do to try to make the situation better for everybody. So Cyril has some really cool stories, and he has a lot of great ideas, and his ideas are about as timely as it gets right now. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I really enjoyed this one. And now I give you Cyril White. Now, hey, everybody. It's Brian Beck, VB Attorneys. I've got my good friend Cyril White. Uh, I've already introduced Cyril, so you know a little bit about him. But one of the reasons I wanted to get Cyril on the podcast is because Cyril knew George Floyd and knows the family personally. Uh, And so we're going to talk about George during this podcast some because uh, I think Cyril and I want people to know he was a real human being. He's not just a symbol. He was a person. And so we're going to talk about George quite a bit. But before we do that, how you doing, Cyril? Man, everything's fine, Brian. Thanks for having me on, man. This is going to be a great show. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm 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 really excited that you're on the show. I mean, I remember uh after uh the shoot or the 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 murder. I want to say shooting yeah. cuz so many times it's a shooting, but this was right. essentially a strangulation. Uh but right. you texted me, I think it was the next day and told me that you knew the family and I was like, "Man, I got to get Cyril on the podcast to talk about this." So, but before we talk about that, Cyril, tell uh, tell the folks listening a little bit about your background, where you're from, what do you do, kind of your your work history and your history uh, with Mr. Floyd. Yes, sir. Well, I'm from Houston, Texas. I grew up in um, the South Side area. I went to Lamar High School. And um, right now, I graduated from uh, University of St. Thomas, and I've been working in China for over 20 years, taking basketball teams and and athletes, sports personalities to China for sports exchange activities. Prior to that, prior to that, with To God Be the Glory, I was doing basketball camps and college exhibition tours. That was the beginning of what led into the international activities. And that was the time that, you know, we started to work uh, work closer with, with Mr. George Floyd although I'd known him since since high school days as we were both coming up in Houston, Texas. And he went to Houston Yates, right? He went to Yates and I went to Lamar. So, you know, those are somewhat rival high schools. Uh, <laughs> and, and also being from the South Side, you know, I was zoned to go to Worthing. So I was in the, the magnet program that bussed me out of the South Side to go to Lamar. So I, had a, I still had a lot of friends. And, and so one of my good friends from Worthing uh, Mike Riggs, who was the player of the year in 1992 for all of Houston, he and Floyd were good friends. They were good friends. And since I was good friends with Mike, Mike would have me go pick up Floyd. And then we would go play at McGregor Park or Sunnyside Park. or We just, Nettleton Park, we'd be all through the South Side and Third Ward playing ball together, you know, during our late high school and early college years. So, and you... You, uh, th- there's a couple things you said there that I think are really interesting. I actually wanted to get you on the podcast before this stuff happened with George, because I wanted to hear from you. Spent a lot of time in China, and there's, you know, with this pandemic, and there's a lot of 
insinuation about whether this oh, yeah. was intentional or not and all that sort of thing. So you have, you have experience not only with George and basketball and sports and stuff like that, but you have an experience in China. And the other thing I want to hear from you about uh, is your experience as a black athlete and as a, uh, I don't, should we call you a coach or what, what, what do you consider yourself when you're taking sports professional sports, sports professional. professional. Okay. Yeah. As a sports professional, what your experience uh, as a black sports professional has been in China and whether th there's any differences you've noticed between maybe the way that especially black men get treated in China versus the way they often get treated in the United States. But before we talk about that, uh, Cyril, tell us, uh, if you remember, like, when was the first time you met George, what, what y'all were doing, but what kind of, what kind of guy he was? Uh, tell us about that. Well, I just remember, you know, because I, I went to Lamar and, you know, Yates always had the reputation of the top basketball, top football, the toughest school. And I just knew that, you know, we had a preseason jamboree. You know, a lot of high schools, they always play a couple of teams before they start. And we, were, we had Yates that year. So we had another point guard on our team that was zoned to Yates, but it was also at Lamar. He was kind of giving us the rundown. And like, man, they got this kid, Big Floyd, man. Big Floyd, he's a monster. So <laughs> it just kind of put it just kind of put a little fear into like all the players, including myself, you know. So and so we got to the gym. We played them and, you know, we lost the game. But that was my first experience with him as a player. We really didn't get close at that time. We really got close is after, like I said, me and Mike Riggs, the guy from Worthing, he and Riggs were so tight that every time I picked up Mike, I just hit, man, let's go get Big Floyd. We got to yeah. get Big Floyd. So that just kind of started that relationship like that. So you and I, and you and I grew up. Uh, I, I grew up playing basketball. I mean, I played basketball basically every single day of my life for four straight years in high school. And I, I so I have a, and, and I was, I graduated in 1991. So a lot of the players that I played against were the same players you played against. Correct. And I remember some of these guys. Uh, Greg sounds familiar, uh, but it, it was it was cool because in the summer I was up in Fort Worth at the time, and we were doing the same thing you guys were doing. We were looking for pickup games. Right, you know, right. you got to go get your big man because I was a point right. guard and you were a guard right. too. So if you want to go exactly. play pickup and keep the court and not have to sit for half right. an hour, you got to go get your big man. So, absolutely uh, right. And George was a big guy. Like, how, how, how big was he? Well, you know, we're listing about 6'7", uh, 230 at that time. So, you know, more realistically about 6'6". Six, six. But, I mean, you even see the current pictures. He was still in shape. He was still lifting weights. Yeah, and still look like he can get out there and give the Texans a little help at the tight end position, and uh, and you know that that factored greatly into the outcome of this situation was you know just how intimidating and imposing that his frame looked. Yeah, and just caused a, a knee jerk reaction, especially when you don't know deep into the character of this person. All you can see is what's on the outside. Yeah, and that's a I think that's a perfect segue. So. Uh, you know, I grew up around big black guys as a basketball player. I hung around guys who are six, seven, six, eight. Uh, and I would, because I grew up like that, that was just kind of normal to me. And I never really thought anything of it. But the other night I was, I posted this thing on my Facebook page. It was an article and it's amazing. We've already forgotten about this, but the black guy that was watching birds in Central Park and got basically got threatened on video by the white lady. Uh, I posted a story about this guy, and I, all I said was, "Man, what a what a nice guy!" Because he had basically said uh, what she did was not right, but we shouldn't destroy her life for that. And and I got a comment from a from a friend of mine named Abasi Thomas. Abasi is a black guy. He's six foot, two hundred fifty pounds. This is the way he describes himself. Mm -hmm. He says, "I might as well be the human equivalent of a pit bull." Right. Here's, here's what he said that really stuck out to me. And I want people, especially white people that are listening to this, to really pay attention to this. Because I think even me, as somebody who spent tons of time around big black men, I don't, right. even I don't think this. So here's what he said, Cyril, and I want you to comment on this. He says, 
I'm six foot, 250 pound muscular black man. I might as well be the human equivalent of a pit bull. I have to plan when I go out in public. If I wanna wait until the heat of the day cools off and go to the park at night, I have to be mindful that at the park at night, I might scare somebody. I have to make sure I have a pleasant face, smile, look not threatening. I can't have a bad day. I can't be angry in public. I can't raise my voice. And then he goes on to say some other things. And I, I, I messaged him. I said, man, that really, Abbasi, that really hit home to me because uh, until you're in the shoes of somebody like George Floyd or Cyril White, uh, you just don't know the kinds of things that that you have to keep in your mind as a black right. man in this country. So talk about that a little bit, Cyril, if you don't mind. Yes, I appreciate his statement. Um, I was asked by a reporter of the uh, 25 uh, black men that I know in in my professional circle, 25 professional black men that are uh, you know, either playing in the NBA or some foreign league, NFL, a sports agent, basketball coach, how many have been profiled and harassed by non-black police officers? And it's 25. Yeah. And you know, 100%. we all have 100%. 100%, and we all yeah. Multiple, you know, it's like waiting until one guy finishes telling their experience so the next guy can share share their story. And, you know, Will Smith recently said that racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. And he spoke about, yeah. spoke about how much now, I mean, even in the case of Mr. George Floyd, we both know if those cameras were not rolling, how different the narrative could be and probably would be as we see what happened even with the initial autopsy that was in the hands of the people of Minneapolis. So, you know, it's a... It's something that you have to keep in mind. I have a black son who was, uh, you know, very strong and very muscular. And, you know, <laughs> you know his, lens, his lens is that he's socialized uh, in a very diverse environment coming up and growing up in private schools. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it comes to a point where sometimes the lens change even in that environment. And you have to have different conversations about, hey, okay, you know, we know we're in this certain neighborhood, but I know your buddies want to go ride skateboards and bikes at night, but, you know, you can't go. You yeah. can't go. So I, we're we're going to come pick you up at that time. And and just uh, just try those conversations that, you know, uh, parents that are, are not black or not, not of color, maybe they don't have to have these same type of talks with their kids. So it's definitely an a ongoing adjustment that has to be made. <clears throat> Yeah, and so, and one of the things, and man, you said a lot there, and so there's a lot of things I want to cover, but one of the things you, you, you referenced the Will uh, Smith quote, which I had heard, uh, that things are just being filmed now, but I would add to that, that there's a lot of stuff going on that's not captured on video. I mean, the, the video oh, yeah. is just the tip of the damn iceberg. And so what right. I'm seeing now, Cyril, is stuff like, people saying, well, statistically, the chances of uh, dying uh, from a police officer are higher if you're white than if you're black. And what, what I want to say is, you have, if, if that is your argument, you have no appreciate, forget about the murders. What right. about just the constant suspicion, the mistreatment, uh, the, the planning of evidence what what about all that stuff? That does not happen in my community. I can tell you that for an absolute fact, and it does happen in the black community far far more often than it should. But one of the th so one of the things you said, Cyril, which you, you talked about the initial medical exam. Correct. The autopsy, and, yes, sir. Yeah, and as a lawyer, when I saw that come out, first of all, in a case like this, you would expect the medical examiner to spend a little bit more time. That came out so fast. It was so rushed. You know this was going to be a big issue. I cannot believe they came out that fast. But there was so much nonsense in that thing. Correct. Like, like for instance, uh, they said possible drug interaction. Like, they're just Correct. basically guessing. What, what I mean, and so, and then you have the, uh, the uh, district attorney come out, I think it was, immediately and say 
uh, there may be evidence that this doesn't is not what it seems. And we all saw the damn thing on video. And so it, it looked to me and a lot of people, I think, that there was a pro that they were starting to basically cover the thing up, like like happens far too often. And, I, and that might have something to do with why there was so much anger. What what do you what are your thoughts on that, Cyril? Well, you know, too, um, just the language, like you said, saying things like there's possible, it could be possibly caused by intoxication and could chances of death increase because of hypertension. And, you know, you start to, you know, whether something is true or not, when you start to make these statements out to the public, it's, it's just it's just a way to kind of plant that type of, of train of thought there. Yeah. And. That's initially what I thought too, was it was just, it was a little bit of legal posturing and some gesturing just to kind of kind of prepare that narrative for the other side. I knew once they brought the independent doctor in, there were gonna be some different findings there, you know, which, you know, as there were. But, um, and it's, it's, it's one of those things where if it's the lens, it's a word I use a lot, it's lens lens people's lens and because you have this lens that you said i'm used to being around big black strong guys i'm not intimidated by that i've had many exchanges when people have limited exchanges with certain ethnic groups it causes it's a lot of unknown and it causes a lot of fear and yeah. we both know that fear is based on ignorance what to god be the glory was is doing in george floyd's memory is setting up some programs that can bridge those kind of gaps, tear that ignorance down, create some non-threatening situations where cops and members of law enforcement that don't normally socialize with people from certain ethnic groups can have a chance to have some exchanges through things like three-on-three -three basketball games, softball games, kickball games, where you're showing up and you're not in your uniform and you don't nice. have your gun. And, and you know, now, of course, this is going to take a little bit of preparation on both sides, you know, to kind of set the stage to bring these groups together. But I think that's something that to God be the glory can do to, to honor George's memory, because I can move in and out of these circles. Yeah, I can move in and out of these circles. And yeah, I you and I are a lot alike like that. Yeah, like we, we, we can we can get in both of these circles, but so many people, they're just completely stuck in one bubble. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And and when you run across someone that you're not familiar to having exchanges with, well, then there's a lot of misjudgment, misinterpretation, and in this case, just total disaster. Yeah, and so part maybe one of the reasons I feel the way I do is because growing up as a basketball player, there would be times where I'd be in a gym and I'd be the only white guy. And I got treated all – now, of course, I was a good basketball player, that helped, but I got treated fan, fantastically, phenomenally, and – and, and, I, and I have this theory, Cyril, that <clears throat> one of the reasons, one of the root causes of uh, black crime, police violence, and all the problems associated with that, if you really want to get down to it, it has to do with the so-called failed war on drugs. Mm. In, the, in the early 1970s, Richard Nixon, and this is on tape, and he started the war on drugs, said, we're going to do this to target the blacks and the hippies because they vote democratic. That is on tape. So the original war on drugs was a complete and total political sham. Now, if you're gonna have a war like that on a certain group of people, what's gonna happen? It, the, the stuff we're happening right now, we're seeing right now. So, you know, until this stupid failed war on drugs that we've wasted trillions of dollars on and destroyed the country of Mexico, until we started that, you know, there wasn't this mentality that the cops were were at war with the right. community, right? And so I love your idea because one thing I think that may be helpful is exactly what you're talking about. We have to stop looking at each other. Police officers have to stop looking at certain communities as the enemy. Correct. These are our fellow human beings. So that that right. is a, that is a that is a fantastic thing that you guys are doing, Cyril. I want to add to that a little bit about that, like as far as, you know, you go back to George Floyd. Okay, in 1998, me and George, we're both finished playing at college. He got a full scholarship, South Florida Community College. 
He transferred to Lee College. Okay, he was having great issues, so he didn't he didn't play out his eligibility, but he continued to get scholarships. Now I come along and I started this touring team. We're going to go play colleges, preseason games, okay? And so we're going to play about eight to ten colleges during October, November, December. George Floyd came and joined the team because he wanted to continue playing at a high level, and we had something organized. Not only did he join the team, but he got other guys from around to come and be on the team, guys that went to Yates, guys that went to Austin, other guys from third ward and fifth ward. And we went out and played college. Okay, now what happened to that? Some guys end up getting college scholarships from that. And that was directly linked to George's recruitment. So now if you're this police officer, and before you put your knee on this man's neck, would you stop to consider the number and scholarship dollars that this man is responsible for, for steering kids down this path? Right, exactly. Can you count for the number of people that he's kept from getting arrested, selling drugs in impoverished neighborhoods, because he pushed them towards an athletic track so they can improve their lives. But you're not thinking like that. You just see a big black guy that you think can beat you up if you make him mad. Yeah, exactly. And, and you got to do so much to make him mad because he's just so cool. Yeah. But you and, don't know that, you know? And I was going to ask you that. Like, so, so what was George like as a person? Like, what kind of guy was he? Natural comedian. Just <laughs> jokes for days. Well, whoever your favorite stand-up comic act is, just imagine Bernie Mac, Chris Rock, just combine them in one, man. This is going to be a bunch of laughs. He was a big old guy. Always got a story and a smile, and you know, just something to lighten the mood. Uh, yeah. I was saying, I was saying this. Um, I was telling my wife. I said, if there's a party, if there was any party that Floyd was at, I don't care who the party was for. If it was Michael Jordan's party, yeah. and you came in the party and you looked around, Floyd was gonna be standing next to Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan was gonna be glad. It was gonna be all good. <laughs> um, there's a Bible scripture that says it is better to be asked to, to, to sit in the, at the end of the table and be asked to come to the head of the table than to sit at the head of the table and asked to move publicly humiliated. Yeah. You get that? Yeah. Floyd, was a, Floyd was a type of guy that you would invite to the head of the table. Yeah. Yeah. When he, when he got to the party, people saw him, they're going to ask him to come and, and get right in the mix. And, 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 I want to, just to be clear, so anybody that's listening to this that may have their head in the wrong place, I want you to imagine, if you're listening to this right now, that there are three people on top of a man who has been saying he can't breathe and is uh, calling out for his mom who's been dead for years, okay? And you have your knee on this person's neck, okay? And then he stops moving, and then he stops responding, and you keep your knee on his neck for another two and a half minutes, okay? So let's just do this real quick. Imagine you have your knee on somebody's neck that is completely non-responsive, and you, starting now. That was 10 seconds. Imagine you do that for two and a half minutes, okay? So anybody that's listening to this that doesn't think this was murder, this was murder, and it was purposeful murder. This is not, and it doesn't matter, frankly, what he was accused of. He was accused of forging a $20 check or some stupid thing like that. Uh, but this was, this was murder. And, you know, Cyril, it, it bothers me that there's this rush uh, for some people when stuff like this happens, to try to blame the victim, try to figure out something wrong with the victim. Right. The victim must have done something wrong. Right, right. Uh, drag his character through the mud or her character. You know, it's the same thing with Sandra Bland. I mean, right. Sandra Bland's dead because some racist cop arrested her for suspicion of having a joint. I mean, are, right. you, are you kidding me? I mean, we got to get our priorities straight here and but let's talk about Cyril. Let, let's let's focus a little bit on uh, what kind of things that we can all do to 
uh, and you've already talked about some of these things, but what are some things that, that, that we can do to make this situation better? You know, one thing I think everyone just needs to take a deeper self, take a, take a deeper look at themselves in the mirror. And that's not to say that if you're taking a deeper look at yourself in the mirror, that you're in, being an admitted racist, because that's not the case. Just we need yeah. to do a little soul searching. It's just like you, you just said earlier, Man, you had a lot of great exchanges, a lot of memories with a, a very diverse audience, but you didn't even really understand how this gentleman was seeing himself as a bulldog. It just kind of, uh, so just a little bit more empathy, um, putting yourself in other people's shoes and, you know, being willing to have those uncomfortable conversations. Because again, what I say, this thing that uh, to God be the glory is going to do in Floyd's memory it's going to be some uncomfortable conversations that we have with these members of law enforcement. For sure. It's going to be, it's going to, it's going to it, that's why I say it's going to, it's, it's going to be some uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations with some of these, you know, black guys or people from different ethnic groups that don't, that don't socialize in a diverse, it's going to be some uncomfortable conversations, but this yeah. is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable to see every major city burning yeah. and, uh, military force on the street and people asking me from China what's going on with law and order in the USA white when yeah. are you coming back to China or can you come back to China yeah. it's just not very reflective of the strength of our nation and yeah. and what our uh, reputation has been around the world yeah and you know that one of the things that one of the things that's really frustrated me, and this is this has frustrated me for years. And I've got uh, social media posts that are four or five years old talking about this. But when did it become the rule in this country that black people could only protest in a way that was acceptable to everybody else? And so, you know, it, it frustrates me because. Uh, Kaepernick and the NFL football players tried to do it peacefully. They tried. And what happened? A significant portion of the country called them, our president called them sons of bitches. Right. And a significant portion of the country thought they were unpatriotic thugs and stuff like that. Okay. All they're doing literally is taking a knee. And you would have thought by the reaction from some people uh, that they were committing murder. So uh, when did it become the rule that we get to dictate how other people protest? I mean, when, when all these uh, idiots with these automatic weapons went to the Michigan State Capitol, I didn't see anybody talking about their protest. Correct. That protest is dangerous. I mean, they are putting potential people's, people's lives at risk. They're literally yelling at the cops. They're screaming at the cops. I don't, the, the same people that are complaining about Kaepernick and the NFL players, they're not complaining about those people. And it, it frustrates the hell out of me. The, the other thing that frustrates me is it, it shows a complete and total lack of appreciation for American history. This country was founded on protest. We founded this country on protest. And, Correct. you know, I, I always think back, uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's stunning how little history people know so like back in the 60s I was talking to my son uh, the other day and he showed me a picture of uh, the civil rights marchers marching arm in arm and he goes dad this is this is how you should protest this is the way to do it and I said son right. five minutes later they were sicking dogs on those folks and blasting right. them with water cannons right 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 so, so, so this is like a, this is like a thing that just keeps repeating back in the sixties people were, right. I'm so sick of people talking about Martin Luther King and 75% of the country didn't like him back then. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. That's the same. I share that sentiment. I don't know how we, I don't, I, and, the, and the frustrating thing is I don't know how we break out of this broken pattern of thinking because it truly is a broken pattern of thinking i mean we look back at you remember the olympians who raised their hands with the black 19, gloves yeah, 1960, yeah. Yep. we look back most of us look back now at those people and we look at those people as heroes we look at i think was it bob beeman i forget the name rafer alston maybe but and i think there was a swiss guy doing it too but but back then people were 
talk, talking about them being unpatriotic. Right. Thugs. It's the same exact pattern. And, and I don't know how we break out of that, Cyril. You know, like I said, it's it's a it's a mindset, and you know that these are mindsets and and uh, ideologies that exist at the top levels of our government, and and these these are idea. If it's at the top levels, and it's not these type of uh, thought processes are not being denounced uh, at the top levels in our country, uh, then they're just going to remain to be pervasive. Even in this case, with with Mr. George Floyd, and I think. If, if Mr. Donald Trump just simply came out and said, this was awful what these officers did to put their knee on the back, on the back of the neck of that innocent man, you know, and he came out and spoke against that and, and, and locked up those murderers, that could change the climate of this country instantly because it would make all these angry people feel like the people at the top really care. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I shared with the Floyd family here. And I want to say it here on this platform. Uh, for me, I do understand. I understand the Black Lives Matter movement. I understand it. But for Cyril White and to God be the glory, I've always been about diversity and inclusion. And yes, Black Lives Matter very much to me because I'm one of them. But I feel like we need to come together and we need to band together. And sometimes people that are on the other side, when you say something like Black Lives Matter, it makes it difficult for other people to know how to join into that. True. So I want to be a part of building the bridge. I'm not against the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement, but I'm here to solicit diversity in the support and diversity in how we move forward with coming up with a plan for all of Americans. Yeah, and I, so my view on this, like, it, 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 I always chuckle when I hear some white dude go, I don't see race, I don't see color. I feel like saying, well, what's, are your, are your eyes not working? Are you colorblind? I mean, <laughs> I can see that you're darker skinned than I am, right? You right. can see that I have blonde hair. But right. what we need to get to the point of is we need to get to the point where that doesn't mean anything about whether you are a good or a bad person. Like, Correct. So, so that's where I think we need to get to. And I worry a little bit, Cyril, that some of the people on the extreme left side of this are, are uh, what you said about Black Lives Matter, I think is great because I think some people on the extreme left side of this debate uh, are making it all about race. Like it's, that's right. what it's all about to some of those right. folks. And I, to me, I don't see how there's in, really any big difference if you're making it all about race between a racist and somebody, I mean, if, if that's what it's all about, uh, the, then to me, you're not thinking straight, so. Correct. Uh, but, you know, and, and the other thing, Cyril, that I've always thought is, let's say you, uh, didn't want to do it because of moral or ethical reasons. Well, just purely logical reasons. Like, why would you treat somebody different because they have slightly more pigment on their skin? It just seems so ridiculous to me. And I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic that the younger generation is headed in the right direction. I, I worry that maybe a lot of this is caused by maybe our generation and the generations above us. And I and, and I'm optimistic that when the younger folks take control that maybe this stuff will be a little bit better what do, what do you what, what's your general feel for that I feel that way too I feel that way too I feel that uh if we go up the ladder to our <laughs> our great grandparents and our grandparents and we check uh their um their their rolodex of friends and how diverse diverse their friends were probably not going to be too mixed probably not going to be too integrated yep. so as we you to go down the line now like you say we both have so many relationships great relationships with people of color people of all different backgrounds nationalities we we've enjoyed a full life in that capacity but there's still pockets in this country where people are still really segregated yeah either either on purpose or by default yeah you know so that's the thing is getting into those pockets of people and creating some opportunity. Maybe where maybe where they're not just totally fully integrating their lives, but you need to have some experiences 
with people that you don't socialize with all the time so that yeah. they can become more human to you. And you can just, and, I, and to God be the glory, we want to create some, some platforms and situations where that can happen. You know, because that, that's that it, it all, let me tell you, you said about the basketball course, and I had a great time. I was talking with one of my, my white friends, and, uh, you know, he supported to God be the glory. He's been a good friend of mine. We coached together in Little League, and uh, we're talking about this, and he's like, you know, Cyril, that door swings both ways. He's like, that, that screen, he's like, you know, because one time I was at a basketball court, and uh, I was the only white guy there. <laughs> and, you know, none of the guys on the court, they wouldn't pick me up because they thought I was, you know, a dumpy white guy who couldn't play. And I said, you know what? You're right. You are 100 yeah. percent right. Like, yeah. that is a form of that. I was like, but let me say this. As a black guy, that's probably the highest platform in which discrimination can be exacted against you. Yeah. <laughs> you're not getting picked up for the, for the game, man. Yeah. You know, he cannot not give you a job or deny you a loan or decide to kill you in the middle of the street. Great point. He can just not Great pick point. you. He can yeah. just not pick you in the game. So there's an inequality even in that, you know? Yeah. But again, I, I enjoy so many relationships with, with white mm -hmm. friends. I have these type of conversations that need to be had with other pockets of white people that don't know a serial white or a person that really can move in and out of these circles and kind of reduce some of this fear and ignorance that exists. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it is, and it, and it's, and it's, it, it's exactly what you said. It's fear and it's ignorance. And so, you know, I, I've, I've kind of over the years, just now, now when I see people of my race that are racist, I just think they're ignorant. I just think uh, the, the people that worry me the most are the people that aren't ignorant, the people that are intelligent people and are still racist those are the people that are dangerous. Most of the people that I encounter, I mean, I'll give you a quick story. When I was at A&M, I played basketball there for a little while, and then I joined the Corps of Cadets. And I was a, a freshman in the Corps of Cadets, and a couple of my classmates were from these, and I, we didn't have any black guys in my outfit, and a couple of my classmates were from these little small towns, and they were using the N-word constantly. And I was <laughs> like, dude, stop <laughs> saying that in front of me. Right, right. That, right. That, that offends me. I don't want to hear that shit anymore. You can right, say it, you can right. say it. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to hear that stuff. And you know what? They stopped saying it. And it but, but it wasn't that they were bad guys. It's that right. they were just ignorant. That's just what right. they heard growing up. And so, you know, a lot of these people, I think it's just a matter of educating the That's ignorant right. people, right? That's right. That's right. You know, just a, a little like a uh, cultural and diversity education, social awareness, yeah. uh, you know, ethnic, e ethnic education, just, you know, like I, that I laughed when you said that <laughs> because I understand that that that's rooted in their lifestyle. Like they yeah. grew, how they grew up, they were just surprised that you didn't join in with that. They didn't even see the error of their ways. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, and same thing, that door swings both ways. That door swings both ways. If you got a guy that's coming out of the inner city projects and he's gone to elementary, middle school, high school with only black people, he's never had any exchange. So when he sees a white person and all he sees is them, them getting killed or the cops getting called on them for what, selling water or whatever, then they're gonna always be apprehensive or a white person comes through the neighborhood, like, what's that white boy doing over there? What's, why is he exactly. over there? That's the cop. He working <laughs> for the feds. But like, no, man, like, you know, it's, we got it. We got it. That, that's what it is. And as a guy, like you say, that's, that's living in China, that has a whole life in a whole other country, it's just, I really hate to see people functioning with this limited lens like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know. and the thing about it is, is if it's ignorance, it can be fixed. Ignorance can be correct, fixed correct. by education. Hate, really, I don't know what you do about hate necessarily, but, it, but if it's just ignorance, all, all it is is education. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, my in-laws told a story years ago. They went to this super nice dinner at this country club in Houston. They get sit, sit, uh, sat down next to this black dude and his wife. 
And I, I know who the guy is. He, I think he was actually an ambassador to uh, some country in the United States. He's a very, very well-known lawyer. He's a partner at a huge law firm, very successful guy. But it was funny because my father-in-law comes back and goes, yeah, it turns out that this guy is a lawyer and it turns out he's a part. And I, he, he acted like I was supposed to be surprised by that. Right. 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 <laughs> There's I lots of black guys like that. Like, why is that surprising to you? But, but the thing was, is he just had never been around it. Like it just, it. you know, and so, um, well, well, Cyril, tell us about one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in and, and you and I have never talked about this. And so this will be the first time I'll hear it too. I want to hear what your experience as a black man was and has been in China and, and also how the black athletes that you bring over there are treated. Generally gotcha. Speaking. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, you know, I, I went to China firstly as a basketball player, right? In 1999, uh, you know, so I was suiting up and playing in games. They treat you great. Like when you're coming from, when you're coming from the, the USA, um, even the word for America, Meiguo, Meiguo, it means beautiful land. That's the really? translation. Meiguo, Mei means beautiful. Wow. Guo is country. So you say Zhongguo, China. Meiguo, USA. The Guo, Germany. Ba Guo, France. So nice. Guo is the... So America is always going to be at the top. You say you coming from the USA, you're going to get paid 10, 15, 20 times more than they're paying the domestic players, and they're going to put you on a pedestal. Everything is going to be great and fabulous if you are an athlete that's a part of the professional leagues in China. Yeah. Now, that athletes there are a lot of foreigners that come to China to work on work visas, uh, teaching English, teaching sports, coming from the US, Australia, UK, parts of Africa. Uh, I see some of the darker skinned Africans uh, definitely get some racial treatments uh, I've witnessed in, in the southern part of China. Yeah. Some of darker, the darker skinned Africans. Um, I've been fortunate coming into China culture as a professional athlete, then making the transition to a sports professional, working with other high profile athletes. So I've always functioned under this umbrella of exclusivity yeah. that kind of weeds me out from some of the some of the things that just other people may encounter in China so that's been my experience yeah so so that's great that's good to hear and you know what what that kind of makes me think Cyril is and that in some ways that's similar to the United States we treat our black oh, yeah. celebrities oh, yeah. we treat our black athletes we treat our black musicians oh yeah like gods I mean and you know <laughs> black culture is all over the place now uh you know it's and so, but but then we don't treat the least of our citizens the same way. We, we, Inequality. Yeah. I got a funny story about China real quick. Uh, I was in the elevator one day and this older Chinese couple, they didn't know I could speak Mandarin. So they got, <laughs> they got it. And so they looked at me and the husband, the husband goes, Tasha Fajorin, he's an African. Tasha Fajorin. And the wife says, oh, Bushu. Tasha Buhei. She's like, no, he's not. He's not very dark. And then the husband goes, Mayo Tofa, Tayo Tofa, your doll. He has no hair. If he had some hair, then I would know. And so then the elevator door opens. And I stepped back. I was like, Busher or the Pungyo Washer Meg Warren. I was like, no, 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 my friend. I'm American. And then I kind of Michael Jack Moon walked down the elevator. <laughs> And they're looking at me like, oh, God. Oh, what a great story. <laughs> trying to size me up, talking about he's not black enough. Yeah, yeah. Who's out to? He's a, uh, he looks like an African. Tasha Faze already. <laughs> like, why are you tripping, man? What, what does that even matter? Oh, man, that is that is an awesome story. I love that. Well, you know, and, and, that, and I think that shows that, and, you know, 
some people that have the skin melatonin that I do, they don't differentiate between a light skinned black guy and a dark skinned black guy, but there is discrimination within the black community. Oh yeah. Too as well. And that's something that a lot of uh, people in my quote community or whatever the heck you want to call it. I, I don't really consider myself a member of any particular community other than the human race. Amen. Human race. Baby. Yeah. But you know what I'm talking about? Like, like they, they don't see that really dark skinned, brothers like my friend Anthony Ware that I play basketball with they they get treated worse like they have to be especially cautious and a guy like George Floyd who's a lot darker complected that's what that's what really did it you know that's what I you know I just kept saying it's like man he's just too big and black man he's yeah. just too big and black to for people to be comfortable just too big and black you have and, to be uh, so uh careful when you're a guy like that you have to do things and think things and act in ways that frankly you and me yeah to make yeah. other people comfortable like you and i don't have to do you have to do that more than i do but you know guys like george my friend abasi they have to do it a hundred percent of the time like abasi said on my facebook he can't have a bad day right you know um say so we're just going to just work hard to honor his memory, like I keep saying, you know. Yeah. Uh, just from the time I found out about his death, I just kept thinking, you know, what could I do? And then I got started getting calls from media to do interviews, and I just kept thinking, what can I do? And, uh, you know, I talked with his brother, and just, just thinking, you know, it's so important what I'm saying about this bridge building thing and just looking at the root of what I feel caused this problem is just this that continues to cause these problems. Yeah. It's just this divide between what se listen, what seems to be what seems to be black and white people, but it's really right and wrong people. That's right. It's not a battle against black and white. It's happening between yeah. whites and blacks. Yeah. But based on a matter of right and wrong. And that's what I refuse. I refuse to 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 let this become a thing that is about race or between races. I refuse, like I spoke about the Black Lives issue earlier. This has to be about right and wrong. And everybody that we talk to along the way, that has to be their approach. You know, it yes, black people will benefit from this, but humanity will benefit from the world being better. That's right. And that's what, uh, boy, what a, what a great way to put it. We will not get where we want to get until people that are not the victims of this are just as offended as people that are. So until, until people that, and I love the way you say that because this is not, at the end of the day, it's not a black and white thing. It's a human thing. It's a, how are we going to treat our fellow human beings? What are we going to do when we see a, a, a community that's struggling? How are we going to react to that? Are we going to react to that uh, with hate and anger? Or are we going to react to that with love and compassion? That to me is the, is, is the real question that we're looking at right now. The way you put it was, was even better, but, but I could not agree with you more, Cyril. So tell us real quick. So to God be the glory is your basketball program. Uh, you, for people watching on YouTube, there's the banners behind Cyril so you can see it. How can people uh, support what you're doing? How can people support your efforts to uh, build these bridges and stuff? I appreciate that. Well, you know, uh, we have, um, have it set up on our website. It's tgbtgsports.com. And, you know, you can Google search to God be the glory sports and go to our webpage. Uh, we have, you know, all of the programs, we have a tribute, we have a tribute to George on the page there, kind of talks about his um, involvement with us, what he did with us, and just kind of starts to talk about we're going to do some special programs in his memory, of course, with his family's blessing. So, um, you know, and there's a lot of other information about, you know, what I've done in my career with To God Be The Glory. So, yeah, you can take some time and spend on the web page and tell you how you can, can be involved and support. Nice. So it's TGBT to God be the glory sports.com. That's your yeah. program right now. Let's, let's let, before I let you go and I've been, we've, I've almost, we've almost gone a full hour. So I, 
I know, I know you're a busy guy. I really appreciate your time, but I, I got to ask you this question uh, because you probably know more about it than most. What are we looking like in terms of basketball, you know, in the next two or three months in the fall? Like, and, and I'm talking specifically in relation to the <sighs> pandemic. Like, what do you, what do you, what are you hearing right now? Well, you know, yes, sir. I miss the heck out of basketball. I got to be honest with you. I miss <laughs> it. <bad. laughs> I know, I know. You know, there's uh, the guys, a couple of guys have been working out, shush, shush, right? Uh, <laughs> I bumped into James, James Harden and Daniel House last week working out here. Austin Rivers was in the gym earlier today. So I know these guys are trying to come back. What I've heard is that they're going to do something down at uh, Disney in July. Okay. Like the, the end of July, they're talking to some plans about creating a bubble like the bubble boy you remember that guy the bubble yeah. boy yeah yeah so they're talking about putting the game inside of some bubble down on the disney property late july uh the players they want to play they want to get back to it but unless there's a real plan of safety to where they feel like they can't expose their families when they return back home some guys are still skeptical chris paul damon Lill damian lillard they've been real outspoken about that yeah uh Meantime, guys just trying to stay in shape, and everybody's itching to get back out there. Fans yeah. are itching, players are itching. Yeah, my son, my 16-year-old son is going into his junior year, and he's, you know, for, for basically two months, there was no basketball, but so he's working out at the house and trying to stay in shape and stuff. But he just yesterday went and had his first training session, and it was an outdoor basketball court with his trainer. So it looks like they'll at least be able to do some of that uh, but you know, I'm. I'll be. I'll be honest with you, Cyril. I'm a little bit worried that if we don't get this uh, coronavirus under control, Correct. we may not have a basketball season for high school and college. You know, I, and, I believe the same thing. Yeah, and even if we do, I can. I can see a situation where, like, if they get fast acting tests or something, like every player, coach, and ref gets tested before every single game or something like that. Right. Right. So right. It's going to change for sure, but. Well, that's good news. That's good to hear that they might be doing some uh, at the end of July. Well, Cyril, uh, man, I'm glad we finally got a chance to do this. Um, I'm, I'm sorry uh, personally to you because I know you knew George, uh, and I'm also sorry for his family. I really appreciate all the stuff you've done, both talking to the New York Times and the other media sources, uh, to, to let people know that uh, this was a real human being that this happened to. and, and uh, and anyway, I, I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I know you got a lot of stuff going on. So thank you very much, my friend. I'm looking forward to it. We got to get together it. before too long, right? Appreciate it, man. To God be the glory. Thanks for having me. And like I said, man, may the memory of George Floyd be blessed. Amen. You've been listening to Lessons from Leaders with Brian Beckham. If you've enjoyed this week's interview, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and keep up with the latest episodes. You can also connect with Brian through his firm at vbattorneys.com.